straight from Silicon Valley. Three generations of venture capitalists and one guest judge equals Meet the Dreamers. Imagine that. They wanted another season. Entrepreneurs pitched billion dollars lost every year. We were both wandering aimlessly. The judges asked the questions. So what's special about you guys? Why will this stay on your platform? But here is the twist. You, the viewers, get to invest for equity. This is your chance to own a piece of the next big idea. To invest in a company, go to meetthedrapers.com. Find them in this week's Entrepreneurs. And you can invest. You can share in their future success. At the end of the season, the entrepreneurs with the most funds raised are brought back for the season finale, where Tim Draper invests in his favorite company. Become an entrepreneur because it's easy to get money. And that didn't happen in Wall Street. Let the games begin. Welcome back to Meet the Drapers. I'm really thrilled to be introducing our judges today. Our judges are Bill Draper, my father, a great pioneer in venture capital, and my team, uh, Siri Stravanis. She is awesome and does amazing work at Draper Associates. And Andy Tang, also amazing work at Draper Associates. He actually kind of runs the business of Draper Associates and Draper University and all of the operations. And for for today, we've always talked about what entrepreneurs should do, but now we're gonna talk a little bit about what they shouldn't do. What do you think an entrepreneur shouldn't do? So little things I pick up, the team dynamics, we have seen business not go well when the founders don't get along. So sometimes we ask them how long they've worked together. Some of the things they do, you could kind of pick up on that. If they talk over each other or start to disagree in front of the investors, so that's immediately a no-no. Yeah, they've got to be better coordinated. And also having faith in each other. They'll fight because they don't trust each other with their job, whatever the job is. How about you, Siri? I think the biggest thing I tell founders is to treat fundraising as a sales process. Just like you wouldn't really uh, get angry with your customer for not buying your product. You can't take uh, fundraising decisions too personally. Most times people get really defensive or you know get very personal, especially when they get rejected, which is kind of silly because you want to have a long-term relationship with all of your prospective investors. We, we are always looking to see if a company is a fit for us. So treat the entire thing like a sales process. Yeah. And and think of it as a process where you're visiting one venture capitalist and you give this pitch and then you get a little bit of feedback and you move to the next one and you, you have a new sales pitch and a new one and a new one. It's not a surprise that Sun Microsystems got the funding on their 21st pitch and when we funded Hotmail, it was on his 25th pitch. It's a natural process. You're getting better. It's hard to tell a young kid how much if you practice over and over, you're gonna get better, but they don't really feel that way. And same with entrepreneurs. They don't really feel like they're gonna get better. They just say, here's my business, so why aren't you investing? You almost want to start with the low probability investors first. The you best want to start with your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> They're the most honest with you. I've served in a lot of boards, and the biggest mistake in that relationship is for the entrepreneur to be carrying some bad news and not tell the board right away. So. That is my biggest concern about what, what an entrepreneur should not do. Something else that sort of strikes me is show how excited you are about your business and show why it is that you're uniquely qualified for this business. You know, thinking about all those entrepreneurs that we've been talking to, the ones that stand out are those that had enthusiasm, energy, totally convinced that they were on the best horse in the game and they were going to win the race. With that, let's bring on some entrepreneurs. Good idea. Woo. But first, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. I'm Stacey Bennett, co-founder and COO of Buki. Hi, I'm Joey Rodolfo, co-founder and designer of Buki. We actually met when we both worked at an apparel company based out of Seattle. I was in the marketing department. And I ran the uh, design department for uh, a big brand. And so I've been doing this for 35 years, designing men's and women's apparel. My background is actually in marketing. I've been a marketing executive for about 20 years. I love brands and I love brand marketing and I love bringing the right product to the right person at the right time. I had an idea and 
have been really focused on uh, apparel technology and fiber technology specifically and what was happening in Japan with uh, fiber technology. We decided that uh, we would venture out. And kind of make our mark on the world. We're really excited. I don't feel nervous. I just feel really excited to get out there and share our story with the Draper family. We're hoping that introducing the Drapers to Buki will create uh, big opportunities to help us reach our goal of introducing Buki as a global brand. Everyone can discover the wardrobe revolution. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Stacy Bennett, co-founder and COO of Buki. I'm Joey Rodolfo, designer and co-founder of Buki. Are you moving in? <laughs> Do you have any openings? You brought your whole closet. Okay, go ahead, sorry. No, that's yeah. fine. At Buki, we're creating a wardrobe revolution with our collection of luxurious technical clothing that can take you from desk to dinner, and it's all machine washable. Unlike other brands out there, all of our fabrics are sustainable made. So we make about 10 different fabrics and they range from pro producing benefits such as thermal regulation, keeping you at the perfect body temperature when it's cold outside, mm -hmm. to a hybrid technology that adjusts to your body temperature. Do you own the technology or are you distributors? No, we don't own any technology. We actually own the secret sauce that we use in putting our, all of our fabrics together. Tell a little bit about the secret sauce. We're on television, you could tell the world. Sure. How, how, all the secrets. <laughs> it's no longer a secret well, sauce. There's a lot that goes into making fabrics. Obviously, it's the technology behind the knitting that's a secret, and also the way we blend these fibers. We bring the fibers in from Japan, and then we blend it with other fibers to create our own fabrics. The most important thing is that we do not use chemicals in finishing our fabrics. We launched the brand in uh, late 2016 with a pop-up store downtown Seattle, and it was quickly apparent that people love Buki. Our average order size is consistently $400, and our returning customer rate is 67%. So when people discover Buki, they love Buki. So we believe in the retail channel as a way to create an immersive customer experience where people can touch and feel and really discover the brand. Additionally, we're sold in about 62 high-end specialty retail boutiques around the country. It's been really right. successful and we foresee opening several more. So we did $845,000 in our first year and we're on track to do 1.3 million this year. Does it feel different? Yes. Absolutely. You yes. can feel the fabric. Please, come on up. Just come up and you guys want to try this? Feel yeah. the different, uh, the different fabrics. Oh, this is in very the soft. Very soft. And then you have to feel our collagen fabric. This, so it doesn't feel consistent. It feels like they're like... They're all different fabrics. They're, they're very there's, different. There's, well, yeah. there's 10 different yeah. fabrics that we've developed. Each fabric has a different um, Here, range we'll of benefits. We'll let you get back to your yeah. thing. Yeah. So with the different range of benefits, we've created a desk to dinner wardrobe. Part of our secret sauce, as I mentioned, is the knitting equipment that it takes to knit fabrics the way we're knitting them. 50 and 60 year old knitting machines are embedded in every factory. Ours are state of the art knitting equipment that we use. Your sales are 1.3 million. Are you making a profit or are you losing? We are yeah. just breaking even. We and how have you been financed so far? We financed ourselves. it uh, ourselves. We've put in a about uh, just over a million dollars of our own money. We wanted to get this thing far enough to be able to get our brand out there. I'm not sure you're familiar with Cutter and Buck. I was a co-founder oh, at yeah. Cutter and Buck Public, so I've done this before with brands. What was your role at Cutter and Buck? I was the co-founder of Cutter and Buck, and I designed the entire brand. How do you divide up your work between the two of you? Part of what we want to do with, the, with raising funds is we want to hire a CEO because right now I play the role of the COO and CMO and Joey plays the role of the president and designer. Yeah, We know we need a global strategist CEO because we see this as a global opportunity with our brand. When I was with Tommy Bahama, I could see how important it was to have that visionary person that's thinking way ahead, that understands the licensing part of a brand. So I've been a marketing executive for 20 years, worked for Amazon.com, launched their direct mail program way back in the day, worked for Nordstrom, ran their database marketing department. And so I really, I head up the operations of the company and then I play a marketing role. Now, why did you do this? I mean, there are so many stores with so many many different clothes. Why start Why? a business in clothes? Every time you put on that shirt, you wear it for one day, it goes to the cleaners the next day. Sustainability is a big deal for Buki, okay? So with our clothes, you wash it. And, and you it iron them out or? Most of them are hanging hang to dry and they're good. Yeah. What do you envision in 10 years? Does this become like a Versace 
In 10 years from now, we would have the consumer mind share of being the leader in technical clothing. I think that is a big mistake. Being, being known as a technical brand mm. does not go with clothing. You mm. don't feel good if you're a technical brand. It doesn't sound, I would try to change your marketing program a little bit. When we have customers come in their store and they don't get technical either, but they do get is easy care and I do I have to iron it? That's the aha moment when they, you tell them that they don't have to apply an iron, they don't have to send it to the dry cleaner. Yeah, easy care, soft care, anything mm. eco-friendly not mm. technical care yeah, i like the, mm. the eco-friendly and you can go into your technology and right. why this technology works right. mm. and how it's wonderful yeah. but i yeah technical clothes yeah okay am i paying a premium for this is this higher end it is higher end and, and you talked about ingredients are they all natural ingredients you said no chemicals go into it. We blend Supima cotton. We blend it with our technology. And in plating, you know, you'll have Supima cotton on the face of the fabric and you'll have the technology against your skin. So Touching inside, does that make you sweat more? No, it actually is the opposite. Or I was in New York recently and we it was hot. We had a customer that came in with a technical shirt. He goes, oh, I'm wearing this technical shirt. It was stuck to his skin. So the fabric was doing absolutely nothing for him, right? So we sent him out with one of our shirts. He came back the next day. He goes, oh my God, I'm dry. I'm dry. So to your point, our fabrics are designed to keep you dry. So what's your biggest problem today? Customer acquisition is everybody's biggest uh, concern as you go out there. Right? Acquiring a customer and being able to tell your story. Now, we think that the competition is going to continue to come this way because the future is that people don't want to dry clean their clothes. And I heard that for 10 years. So this is the future. We need to scale this up quickly so we can stay ahead of uh, the curve. Well, terrific. Thank you Thank so you. much Thank for coming yeah. to meet yeah. the Drapers. Our pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank Pleasure Great. to meet you. Welcome yeah. to the show. Pleasure to meet you. Too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for the great question. Pleasure. I think it went great. Honestly, it's like anything you go in with a plan and there's a little curve in the road and you just kind of go with the curve in the road and they had great questions. They had great questions. Some other people have not asked. We talk about our brand position because we're a new brand in this space and you know we refer to it as a technical apparel brand. People are confused oftentimes. But the aha epiphany moment happens when you actually try the clothes on and you actually wear them and you know that you don't have to dry clean them, iron them, that you can wash them. And that's, I think, what we had to get through. I think our big picture takeaway was the question that Bill Draper asked. Our brand positioning being so founded in technical is something we're definitely gonna take away and talk about with our team and uh, hopefully come back around the finals with some pivots that they'll notice and be impressed with, hopefully. I think what we're most excited about with the crowdfunding is that we started the brand in Seattle and we want to expand to the rest of the US and then eventually the globe. And so this allows us to accelerate that goal much quicker. We'd love if you could join us with our wardrobe revolution and invest in Buki. Go to republic.co forward slash Buki, B-U-K-I. Join the wardrobe revolution. Boom. So let's see what our judges thought about Buki. What did all of you think? I thought Buki will be a success. Very good concept. It's good technology. I gave them a great brand idea. <laughs> And, if they uh, take if it, they take it, they'll <laughs> win. If they don't, forget them. I think this is sort of the golden age of consumer brands. I don't know if 20 years ago we'd be investing in a clothing brand. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of brands that have sort of built a whole new way of selling something that's very ordinary, like Casper and mattresses. This is the right time, and I think they have a lot going for it, but I didn't see anything new on the business model front. To think about investing in innovation and technology, I don't think of textile as an industry, but think of brand potentially. Then there's our thinking, I actually remember learning in marketing, there's something called a snob good. It's too cheap. Businessmen want to feel like they pay up, we pay $100, $200 for a dress shirt, We're getting high quality Italian dress shirt. So these guys, their price point is about $200. So they could potentially have an interesting breakthrough. And coupled with this guy who has obviously done it before, it gives me some confidence. But I don't like the fact that they don't have a CEO. I thought that was a little bit weird. Right, and I don't I know why that guy He should be the CEO. CEO. He, he's a founder of a company right. that he's went He's certainly public. capable of doing it. I, I understand that. In fact, I thought that was a positive, that they 
didn't try to do it themselves. Really, I I would I would advise them to embrace it and and take up the CEO role. One of them should. Funny, Funny I had a totally different. Really, <laughs> we're gonna go to the crystal ball, and we'll get a little vibe. And then we'll sort of see what the crystal ball says. Oh, you've already gotten your butt. I'm, I'm waiting. My, you, you have good spiritual reads. That's why yeah. you hired me. I did. <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay, I got it. I got mine. Okay, here's how we vote. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around, and then you choose, okay? Thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs down, down, thumbs, thumbs all, all around. around. Wow, three ups and me. Wow, I'm usually the up. I was sideways because there's just so much competition in clothing and building a new brand, no matter what the technology or whatever yeah. is yeah. tough, but they've made great progress. 1.3 million in sales, but it's not up to us. It's up to you as a viewer. You can vote, you can invest, this is the only show in the world where you can actually invest in the companies that are being interviewed. So go to meetthedrapers.com and vote or invest. So let's bring on the next entrepreneur. But first, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. My name is Brian Canty. I'm the CEO and co-founder of LIA, which stands for Live Event Assistant. The reason why I started Leah uh, and my co-founder as well, uh, we're both huge live music and live event fans. I've been to over 700 concerts in my life, so I've always been super interested in the industry itself. And so I had bought uh, tickets to a very popular concert before, bought them on Craigslist from another person and showed up and the tickets were not real. And that was kind of the moment where I said, you know, there's gotta be a better way to, to buy and sell tickets and thought that a lot of the existing solutions out there were probably a little clunky and thought that, you know, we could do a better Better job by you know doing it over messaging platforms. Tim would most likely be interested in our company. I think just given our sales growth and kind of vision for artificial intelligence and natural language processing, and we have a kind of scalable, repeatable model that we can kind of bring to the masses over all of these messaging platforms like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Canty. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Leah. Leah stands for Live Event Assistant, and she helps live event fans discover events and purchase tickets all through messaging platforms. Send Leah a text, say, hey, can you get me three tickets to the Jay-Z concert in the balcony for under $120 this weekend? And Leah will go help you out. It's the easiest way to get tickets, to find events, and to plan an event with friends. A lot of the times, you might be going to an event with your friends or with your family, and say, okay, Kanye West is coming to town. I might set up a group chat with those friends. When we find out how to, who wants to go, who's available, which day, then we might leave and go to a third party site to buy those tickets. With Leah, you can just add Leah to the group chat, buy the tickets in the chat, split the tickets, split the payment, easy as pie. How do people do it without uh, Leah? So discovery of events is actually separated from the purchase and planning process, right? So the first thing you have to do is find out when an artist is coming to town. There are separate discovery apps. You might have to follow these artists or sports teams on Twitter to find out when the events are. Then from there, then they'll go to a third website to find the tickets that are relevant to them. But again, all of this discovery, planning, purchase, payment all happens natively in the messaging platform and you don't have to download a separate app. It's all on messaging apps that you already use. No one downloads apps anymore. The average apps downloaded per month is actually zero but people spend a lot of time on their uh, smartphones and they're spending their time in maybe five or 10 apps. The majority of those apps are messaging apps. So that's Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. This is the future of e-commerce and, and internet usage. If you look to countries like China, where they have platforms like WeChat, it's literally a single uh, chat application where you can book an Uber, you can buy tickets to a movie, all within one platform. So WeChat's gonna be your competition. Eventually, And yeah. Facebook, uh, it would be easy for them to make this a feature, wouldn't it? They could, yes, but their approach is a platform approach. You could use that argument for the Apple App Store, right? So they could have copied all of those apps and, and basically made those features of the iPhone, but they didn't do that because it's just too hard for a single company to make Snapchat, Instagram, all of those apps are better served as third-party developed apps as opposed to done in-house by Apple. StubHub could build a chatbot on Messenger, sure. WeChat, that would potentially take out your supply chain. 
The supply actually works a little bit differently. So a good corollary is the travel industry. So you can go on Kayak or Orbitz or Expedia and book the exact same hotel room uh, on all of those sites because they're all coming from an OTA or a third party exchange. Now, does that mean that they can't still build a chatbot? Sure they can. But the way we started this company was actually, we had a different idea for ticketing. We started in 2015 and the way we were uh, marketing, it was over Craigslist. So we were using Craigslist to funnel people into an app. And that's where we learned that getting people to download an app is really hard. Right. But we found that the front end of the experience where we were interacting with these customers, we found that they liked the really high touch concierge experience that we were giving them where they could ask us more specific questions about, hey, can you get me tickets in the front row or behind the 49ers bench or whatever it may be, as opposed to when they're looking at um, a StubHub or something like that where it's just a static website and they have to go um, do that themselves. So that was the learning that we took. We said, okay, can we kind of figure out a way to scale this kind of high touch concierge experience, but do it on a more scalable platform like Facebook Messenger? And that was kind of how we got here. How do you make money then? Do you charge a premium on what you can get. Exactly. So the ticketing exchanges that we work with, we get the tickets at a wholesale price, the same price that, um, again, a StubHub or a SeatGeek would get their tickets at. What's your background? My first company I started, I was 15 years old, was a ticket brokerage. Just been obsessed with live events <laughs> since I'm a young one. Uh, I've been to over 700 concerts in my life. Can selling... you hear us? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a little bit slow on the, uh, the response here. That's it. Next time I'll wear my earplugs to the next concert. I spent some time in finance, and then after that I worked at a startup uh, called Hitch, which is basically the predecessor to pooled ride sharing. So, How does that compare to your old Craigslist manual process by human? Was it higher when you have human versus AI? So right now we still have humans in there. So we first tried to just build it all using natural language processing and yeah. it was really hard and it actually wasn't a good experience. And I'm then, surprised because I thought the ticket buying experience is fairly straightforward. There are only so many questions you could ask, but that's because I don't go to enough concerts. Yeah, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so a lot of companies actually started out trying to do horizontal NLP where they would basically have one chatbot that you could ask, okay, um, book me an Uber, now buy, now buy me a, a set of flowers or whatever, and the chatbot gets very confused. So you have to go very, very narrow and just go after one vertical. Yeah. And again, in this case, ticketing is our vertical. What are your revenues? We launched in January of this year. We were doing about 5K in sales, and we've grown 10K a month since then, $80,000 in monthly sales. What's the one thing you're obsessed with? Um, so it's repeat usage. It's a marketing and branding game to try and attract users, especially when the supply is not necessarily differentiated. So we can get users in the front door by you know paying to acquire them, but do they like the experience enough to come back? And that stat has gone from about 5% of our sales in the first month and last month it was 23%. Why have the chatbot companies not become really big? And why is yours gonna be different? I think most people have the, the thought that they're gonna build this thing that you know is fully sentient. They basically try and come at it from a tech perspective and not from a user perspective. And, and I think that that's really hard to do in terms of creating a good user experience. Well, thank you for coming to meet the Drapers. Yeah, no problem. Great. <laughs> good. good to thanks have you on the show. Great, yeah, great hearing about good it. Good to meet you. Yep. Thank you. Good luck. Great, yeah. yeah thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I think it went well. Um, it's hard to tell from their reactions, but I felt like I was able to answer all the questions that they asked me. I wasn't sure about the two new judges. I kind of had seen some films before of the, the two Drapers. The other two judges asked some good pointed questions and it seemed like they kind of understood what we were trying to do. I think Tim Draper was, he seemed like he understood chatbots, artificial intelligence, all that stuff. He had some hard questions about competition and why the chatbot industry hasn't taken off. You know, I think he understood what we were trying to do and. I felt like I was able to provide the, the right answers to him. In a few years, the main way that you're going to buy tickets is using Leah. It's just way more convenient and, and it's a much better experience for live event fans. That's what we're aiming for. So let's see what the judges have to say. What did you all think of Leah? I really like the founder. I thought, comes through, he's passionate about ticketing. He started when he was 15 years old. So clearly he's in it for the passion and he kind of evolved with technology. So I kind of like the vision, but I do think it's a little bit early. It's still interesting to see how their users will really embrace all the chatbot technology. But overall I thought it came through really well and I really got a feel of of what he's feeling as a founder, and I thought that was great. I really resonated with his idea. While he was speaking, I was thinking, I've never, I, I can't remember thinking, God, I wish I could talk to someone before buying these tickets, because I feel like that's what a lot of internet websites actually solved for us. We didn't have to go through that awkward conversation with someone going through really basic question and answers. I'm not sure that they really solve a massive problem. It's just 
probably easier to go online and select your seats and I'm just not necessarily a fan of this type of business. Maybe we should ask Siri. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, what do you think of chatbots? It says Chad Potts. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a different You're show. absolutely yeah. right. How about you, yeah. Dad? What'd you think? Well, I, I, I like him, and I have never been to a concert. We're going to have to go. It. You know how I do it? Beyonce is I, playing. We're going to have to know, go. You know what I'd do if I wanted to go to a concert? I'd ask my wonderful secretary to <laughs> just <laughs> arrange it. So you have a real feel for this marketplace. I really know. <laughs> you have a yeah. My feeling was he is good. He understands his customer because he is his customer. He's trying things. He's going incrementally. Yep, I like. That. And I, I think that will pay off over the long haul. I'm not sure the chatbot solution is what I'm looking for. I think it's still too early. That's why the big guys haven't jumped in yet. We're going to have to consult our crystal ball. So let's see, what, what do we all think of Leah? And, oh, I'm, I got it, I got a feel. <laughs> let's do it, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around, boom. Oh. Three sideways, one down, interesting. But it's not up to us. It's up to you, the viewer. Go to meetthedrapers.com. You can vote up or down. You can invest. We are the only show on television that allows you to invest through a crowdfunding app and be a part of Leah. And then let's go see our next entrepreneur. But first, let's see what's going on behind the scenes. <laughs> My name is Rob Smith. I'm the CEO and founder of The Fluid Project, based in Manhattan, New York City. The Fluid Project is the world's first gender-free store. And what's so important about that is that whether you're non-binary, trans, queer, this is an opportunity to shop and be in a space that's safe and inviting. You're greeted with an acceptance of who you are. And ultimately, what I want to do is have society rethink about this binary structure that we've created, these limitations we created by being strictly male or strictly female. And why, why should it be possible for a man to not wear makeup or jewelry. Why is that strictly female? Why we're now we're finding what women can do and given the opportunity that only men have given in the past. So right now this is a really important time for the Fluid Project because it's been completely self-funded by me. Now the opportunity is where do we go from here? And it's about getting people who believe in the mission to invest in the mission and spread the word that I couldn't think of a better opportunity than create a crowdfunding opportunity, do it with the Drapers, and share this with people around the world. All right, you ready? Break the leg. Come here, you. <laughs> Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Thank Give you us your much. pitch. You got it. So my name is Rob Smith, but I want to tell you about the Fluid Project. So first of all, this is a store for everyone, but it's really focused on Gen Z. Gen Z right now will be, by 2020, 20% of the population in this country, but 40% of the spending power. So they're coming in and they're a force to be reckoned with, and they're a fascinating group of people. Almost 60% of them shop in an area other than what's designated for them. So boys will shop in girls' department, girls will shop in boys' department, they're not stuck. Gen Z is about? 13 to 22, okay. so this is a 13 to 22 year old group. Okay. So they're moving into this buying power, and a lot of companies don't really understand who they are, they're trying to adapt to them, we built a company for them. But it's for everybody. Our mission statement is to challenge boundaries with humanity. That's what we do every single day. We're also gender free, so the, this space where gender does not limit you on what you are, what you're capable of. The next is gender neutral fashion. It's happening right now if you follow designers, they're going into androgyny, they're, they're mixing up the men's and females line. They're starting to do it at a very high end, but this is about, Fluid Project is approaching more of a commercial space that's for young people. So this, Who do you have helping you in the company? So the company right now, it's, it's essentially me, but I've got a really talented team of young people are really hardworking, well, it's about 20 of us. And then I have a board of advisors who are my peers or people who know different parts of the business who coach and advise me every single month through the business. What Take are your biggest one. sales items? The biggest is t-shirts by far. So about a third of the, the sales come from graphic t-shirts. I'm wearing one right now. They have, it, it really reflects who we are. They're made in California. They're printed in New York. We work with a company that works with young people, teaches them a skill, they've been marginalized. So it's all about investing back in the community. What percentage of your SKUs are Zero. can be found 
on Amazon Zero. Zero. So Zero. it's all unique. You're you're it's creating all... every one of the items. Uh, so what we do items. is there's there's sure. different things. First of all, we work with a few brands like Levi's and Fila. We merge the men's and women's line together, which is really interesting way of curating it. Then the other brands we carry, you're not going to find anywhere else. Every Tuesday from 11 to 12, we have an open house where designers and artists come in and show us their product. And then we set up a week-long installation. So there's always something fresh and different. How much of this is mission-driven? How much of this is shareholder value creation? Yeah, I mean, it blurs together because if you look at Gen Z, they care about this stuff, that they're going to see the mission and the purpose and they're going to start spending their dollars that way, so everyone wins. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your products itself? How do you design them? How do you procure them? Um, yeah, what so a great example would talk about our own product. So we, we, we fit, do fittings, we do it on a male and a female model, just to see how it fits on both. So this is a t-shirt that's been fitted on a male and a female. It fits me pretty well. These are jeans that we carry from another brand. They're women's jeans. Uh, I'm creating a gender-free pair of jeans, but I wanted to see what it felt like to wear women's jeans. It's a really interesting experiment. So <laughs> the pockets are really tiny. Women know this. They're really small. The zippers are super short. Pockets are a big problem. I don't know why they don't put pockets It's ridiculous. I think, I think women are going to be so excited about this because you literally, if you put your keys in here, it's literally, it goes that far. You can't really put anything in here. The other thing we did is we took sizing away. So it took words like extra small and extra large away, replaced with numbers because there's a certain amount of body shaming that happens when you walk in the fitting room and you're like, what size are you? You say extra large. Sometimes a person feels really bad about themselves, but you pass them out four, they feel much better about that. And, is your, and you have one store so far? So far, one store. We've been and so you're March. thinking that you might try to franchise this Absolutely. store? That's in your uh, 2020. Right now, my goal is to make this store as successful as possible, which is doing really well right now. We're do, right now we're doing about, my overhead's about $100,000 a month, and we're doing about $100,000 in sales. And like, those sales, are, what are the margins on those sales? So the margin's right about between 55 and 60%, because we're private label is half the business, which is a higher markup, and the other half is other brands. So you're losing about 50 or 60,000 a month. This is the way I look at it. I invested in the glump at the beginning of the season, which is the stuff. We sold it, so now it's getting to the place where I'm just selling the stuff that I invested in. So now it's starting to make money, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah so I took the accountability for the investment. And the How much inventory. did you invest? I'm about 500,000, 600,000 into it so far. Wow. All my own money. How did you earn that? So my 22 years at Macy's, my last job there was executive vice president over all the buying for Macy's. Then I went to Victoria's Secret. Then I went on to Levi's and Nike, where I was the chief product officer for Global for Kids. After that, I kind of quit my job. I decided I was looking for more purpose in my life. And that's where the Fluid Project was born. Is the gender free, is that a big trend in Gen Z? Yep. Are there other movements that's going on? When I, when I decided to do this, then I found out that this movement is happening, that I didn't realize how big this was. So gender itself is a social construct that we've created over hundreds of years to say, men are this way, women are this way. But it's fascinating if you cross borders or go to different countries, you've got India, men are wearing skirts, lungis, and dresses, and men are holding hands, and, and social, the social construct we created. So Gen Z is like, you know, screw this. Like, this is how we want to be. And no one's taught them, it's just something that they They've adapted and they're moving towards. You don't think it's a fad that would oh just... Oh, God, no, it's not a okay. fad. It's not but a if fad. the zipper doesn't go all the way down, there aren't many guys who are going to be uh, well, that's confident why, that's enough why, that's, to do what you're that's doing why I there. It. So, yeah, I do have to draw my pants, so, <laughs> which is always kind of funny. <laughs> At the airport bathroom with my pants down. <laughs> Men's clothing is... Is fo the focus is on comfort, and for women, it's about style or fit. Yes. Which is stupid. It it's so stupid. Like What's so fun is like I watch people walk into the store, and you know they're tourists. They think it's super fun. Like a, it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife. They're like we can shop at the same store together instead of going to different floors. They have a blast. Or there's two two dads bringing their kids. One who's non-binary. The other is a 10-year-old boy and their best friends, and they're shopping together. And to find a space that they can be themselves, to shop free, to be their authentic selves, it makes it all worthwhile. Well, terrific. Thanks so much for you coming on to Meet the Drapers. Good, right. 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 I'm, I kind of like pink. I know. Yeah, I can good. live with yeah. that. Yeah. Now you got to take pictures and Good hashtag job. it in social media. Yeah, yeah. Get all of your social media. Oh, yeah. We want all your friends to know. Yeah. 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 One of the lower. Thank you. This is great. I like this. Fanny no. pack. Well, you know it's not called a fanny pack. You can't call it a fanny pack in Britain. It was good in there. I think that I got most of my points across. I probably would do a few things differently to try to focus more on the money I'm raising and what I do with it. I think we had a really good rapport. We had a really good conversation. I was a little concerned that they wouldn't completely understand the concept of the business because it is for Gen Z, for 
essentially 13 to 25 year olds and some of them really got it and you never know. I think Andy Tang and Siri didn't have the most questions but I think they understood it and understood the business piece of it but also understood the human piece of it. Tim got warmed up at the idea and near the end had a lot more questions, a lot more engaged but it just took a little bit of education to get there. But overall it was, the rapport was great. The interest level seemed really good. I'm moving ahead with this crowdfunding with Republic.co uh, and I'm gonna raise a million dollars. We're gonna take this business from being one store and a decent website to being a worldwide brand. So let's see what our judges thought of Fluid. What did you all think of Fluid? I really loved it. So um, again, we spoke a lot about branding. I think Fluid is at the beginning of this huge upside on what is a political movement as well. Gender fluidity and kind of questioning why women must wear pink or why men must wear blue all the time and why we can't really wear what we want. It's, it's a big conversation, but it's also the right time for it to become a consumer trend. So I liked everything about the business as a consumer. Now, I have some questions about how the business would grow but I think this is really cool. I learned something today. I don't know anything about Gen Z. I actually used to pride myself knowing a lot about millennials <laughs> because we hang out with them at Draper University. <laughs> I think for me, I knew very little about gender fluidity. I thought maybe that is a, a niche market, but maybe it's not. The, the gender-free clothes, I, you know, I don't think that's going to fly very high. You think it will. Actually, I, I, we shouldn't be looking at this as something that's entirely new. So think about Dollar Shave Club, right? The first thing that they did was razors were always sold separately to men and women and the women's razors were always more expensive. Dollar Shave Club came along, said there's just one razor, same price, it's low and it's for everyone. And they grew because that's what people want. People don't want to pay a gender premium. Yeah. So my thinking was the store is really unique and interesting and I yeah. think if those clothes were really great then they'd probably buy them. The market is one that even if he is the pioneer and he gets in there early, uh, will be replicated and somebody who's a really top marketing business person is going to win this market. If it takes off, his competition will flood him. So I think he will require will require a true expert in retail. And it's this is a tough think, yeah. business. I'd be a customer, but I don't think I'd be an investor. But let's check with a crystal ball. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some Beanie surprise. beanie. Fluid. I'm feeling fluid. Druid fluid. All right, I got it. Okay, here we go. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around. Three down, one up. <laughs> Actually, that's usually a good sign. So it's not up to us, it's up to you. So you can vote up, vote down, or you can invest. Just go to meetthedrapers.com. Stay tuned for the Crypto Corner where I'll interview some extraordinary expert in crypto, Bitcoin, blockchain. And after that, we're going to do a big wrap up. So I'm here with Monica Puchner, and she's starting a company called Hilo. And somehow she wanted to come to me for some advice. Monica, welcome to Meet the Drapers. Thank you so much. And tell us about Hilo. So we are creating a social network for crypto. You can follow your friends, follow other traders, and then you can see a dashboard of what people are saying on why the price is falling. Maybe there's regulation happening and that's impacting the price in some way. Are you launching a token that's gonna be used on this platform or are you gonna go with Bitcoin? We did write a white paper. We are gonna be launching a token. That will probably happen at the later part of this year. Good. Coming so soon. here are the things I would think yes. about. One is, where are you going to be domiciling your token? Yeah. And I would pick, I think most people are going to Gibraltar or Malta or Singapore. Mm -hmm. And just make it simple. The lawyers have been making hay out of this. And they're doing a beautiful job of <laughs> creating a really complex yeah. system for you. Make it simple. You know, you've been involved in Bitcoin for a long time. What kind of advice would you give kind of young entrepreneurs? If the company wins, you want your investor to win. Of course. If the token wins, you want your investor to win. As an investor, what yes. I look for is aligning myself with the entrepreneur. The alignment requires me to own a piece of the company and a piece of the token. Mm -hmm. When I look at the business, mm -hmm. I'm usually looking not at the 
ICO that's being sold to me. Is there a reason for people to buy those tokens after the ICO? Is there a real marketplace that is being created? You're saying, hey, we're gonna be the community around yes. tokens and yes. Bitcoin, and people will talk about it, and then they're gonna to wanna to trade in some sort of token. Make sure there is a reason for people to buy those tokens. Yeah. What's happening now is all those tokens everybody bought, now they're all going, wait, what do I have here? Yeah. And then they're selling them into Ethereum and Ethereum's falling because they're yes. trying to get out of Ethereum. Yes. The ICO aside and the, and the token economics aside, what should I do next as an entrepreneur? What would you do? I would think long and hard about the token mm -hmm. and how it works. Just go back to the, just the basics and say, why are people gonna buy this token? Why are they, how are they gonna use the token? And just really understand how each of those pieces work. And you've got to create a network that Facebook can't just turn around and create. Right. Because they have 50 billion users or whatever <laughs> it is. <laughs> Almost the entire world. Right. right. And then why are you and your team particularly suited to do this job? Yeah. And why is it somebody else isn't? If somebody was asked you, okay, how do I learn more about Bitcoin today or crypto? What would you tell them? Where, where would yeah, be the first probably, place? Well, at first I'd tell them to go buy some. Yeah, that buy would be some. at Coinbase. Exactly. Or crypto, I would go say, go buy a ledger. Yeah. Get it out and then look at it and say, I don't need a bank. Yeah. I got money right here it's on mine. this little thing. Yeah. This is mine. Yeah. I tell people to do those two things so that they know it themselves. It's not all hearsay, because yes. whenever I look at press, I train myself to say, who wrote this? Yeah. Every yeah. time, every time I read something, who wrote this? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why'd they write it? Instead of like, oh, these are all the facts that must be true. And my advice to you is make sure Keep there's a- Keep it simple. And make sure there's a <laughs> real reason for me to come to your site, or ideally for somebody who's a lot younger than me to come to your site. Yes and your customers will grow with you, be flexible and grow with you. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much for the advice, Tim. This has been wonderful and glorious to get to meet you. Your advice is gonna really help us traverse the next steps in our journey, so Monica, it. it's great to have you here. Yeah. And since you've Always been on Meet the Drapers, what happens is we adopt you. So now you are a Monica Draper. Monica Pukner Draper. Okay, Monica Pukner Draper. Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. So welcome. Thanks for being on the show. So, what did you all think of this amazing day? I thought we had some really good entrepreneurs. A lot of variety in the, what they were trying to do. I'm usually 90% for them before we even meet them and hear yeah. what their idea is, just because I love entrepreneurs. And so I thought it was a great day. I think it was a great day too. We saw Leah, the new kind of ticketing on the bots. We saw this fluid. I mean, I think the guy is a, a really good brander. I mean, I gave yeah. him a down, but he, he's he got a brand and he's figured something interesting out. And then what was our third one? Buki. Buki. Technical wear. So we had two fashion ones this yeah. time and tickets. So you can go get dressed up and then you can go to <laughs> go to your concerts. So I thought it was really a great day. And I think I feel that same way about entrepreneurs. They're doing something, they're, they're mission driven and they really have something to, to do and prove. Of the three, I think I would probably choose the, you know, what's really funny is I might, of the three, I might choose the one that I voted the lowest on. The flu? Because I think the guy has so much energy that something might actually happen. Which one? Coming around to the revolution. I, I, I may be coming around to the revolution because there's a power to that personality. Yeah. Although I don't know if he has the skills to run a good retailer. And, um, but he's the one who kind of sticks with me the most of the three. My vote is for Fluid all the way, completely from a business lens. If you can expand or double the market size for every product that you've got, then that's great for a business. Plus, I think he's great. With all three companies, it was really interesting how personal journeys kind of translated into a lot of problem solving and then building a business, which is what we love to see. In case of Fluid, I think that he took his experiences from Macy's and from Victoria's Secret, saw what was going on in the market and took personal experiences and personal view of the world to create a business, which I think is great. So one, this was a great day, but um, I, my words are fluid. I think I'm staying with the safe bet. I know the tech market well. When it comes to brands, to me, it's almost a hit-driven business. You know, I would bet not on the horse, maybe bet on the jockey. 
right? So Buki, I think it's great. You have a founder who has redone a couple times, so that seems like a safer bet. And then the last one, Fluid Project, I think the founder is just so passionate. But the Leah Project, that to me, it's a, it's more deterministic. You go from each technology shift, there ought to be a new winner. It may not be a billion dollar outcome. So I think there's some value. I'm really appreciative of them coming in because I derive energy from their pitch. By just sitting here, I feel more energized before the meeting started. So, so that is something that's very difficult to quantify, and I, and I feel that. Well, great to have all of you here on Meet the Drapers. Well, uh, thank you. You're, you're both honorary drapers already. <laughs> and Dad, great to have you on yeah. the show once again. So see us next time on Meet, Meet the, the Drapers. drapers. <laughs> all right. It's a Toshi Nakamoto. So for Christmas, I took a whole bunch of my male friends and got them all pedicures and manicures. And they were so scared to walk into a salon. I'm not saying that pedicures are particularly feminine, but it's just really not, never, never been acceptable for men to kind of enjoy taking care of themselves, right? Getting a face mask on. What but, is a face mask? <laughs> oh my God. After this, we're getting you a face mask. No. <laughs> No you, your life will never be the same again. You know, I think we should have a whole show on this, but we're out of time. So, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Banker shock bureaucrats, too. Governments don't know what to do. Live long and blockchain.